Today, I'm joined by Joe Abercrombie, one of my absolute favorite authors in the world. And we're going to be talking about how to write fantastic character introductions in your fantasy novel. Joe has published over a dozen fantasy novels and has sold well over 5 million copies. And what we're going to be doing in today's call is actually be going through like the specific text of the opening chapter from A Little Hatred, uh, along with chapter four, which introduces a different character as well, so we can compare and contrast the two. A Little Hatred is about a fantasy world being dragged, kicking and screaming into an industrializing age. And we follow a cast of characters as they attempt to profit from, resist, or simply survive the change. And so we'll be looking through some of these specific details and choices that Joe made throughout this writing here. But first of all, I'd love to ask, like, what is your approach or general philosophy to writing first chapters to begin with? I suppose the very first thing is you want to kind of grip the reader. You don't want to spend time messing around. Connect them to the character, first of all. Give them a strong sense of the character and their kind of their their voice and their concerns and their way of seeing the world as quickly as you can. You're trying to establish the kind of world and, and the, the scenario in which they're operating. You're trying to hit the ground running and kind of get the plot going um, from that character's point of view. So often you're trying to create some sense of of sort of jeopardy and action and excitement. So there's a whole kind of range of different things. I mean, you're setting up the writing style you'll use for that character. And over time, I've tried to get better at doing all of those things at once, but there's always a certain level of trade-off as well. What made you decide to start with this opening chapter here? And, and perhaps you could maybe begin with just a, a quick summary of what goes on in this opening chapter here with Ricky. It's interesting. I mean, I think I could probably have equally started with Savine or with Orso or with Leo, any of the kind of central quartet. I guess there's a central quartet of characters and then there's a couple of slightly less central points of view as well. And in a way, their stories are all kind of intertwined and, and scattered throughout. Sometimes certain of them come to the fore, sometimes others kind of step back and it could have been any one of the four so i'm not absolutely i couldn't tell you for definite why i chose to start with this one i suppose ricka is the sort of most well the only character who's really got a kind of magical something mm. magical going on with them it's quite a an unmagical series compared to others that i've done uh, but she has this magical talent of the long eye which is a sort of highly unreliable ability to seeing to the future, to see things that haven't happened, to see things that might happen. It's all very unclear and unreliable. But she has this ability to see into the future. She has these fits uh, in which she gets visions that may or may not give her some sort of clue as to what's going to happen. And so she has a vision in this first chapter that kind of anticipates various elements of what's going to go on in the series altogether. And so I suppose from that point of view, starting with this prophecy which may or may not be true and yes. is used in various different ways um, is kind of appropriate to anticipate where we're going to go as we go. Although Ricker in a way is not totally central because she's off to the side, off in the North away from where a lot of the other central characters are, which is kind of in the, in the civilized heart of the union, if you like. Um, so it serves sort of as a prologue, if you're that kind of prologue where we're not in the heart of the action, we're looking at something slightly outside of it, mm. um, while also getting the ball rolling on one of the kind of central plot threads and one of the central characters. But as I say, we could easily have started with Savine, who we're going to come to in a little while. And Savine perhaps is more demonstrative of what's really going on in these books at this point with because she's this investor this kind of new money this person who sort of very much represents the the rising industrial revolution that's that's happening in the books talk me through how you approach first sentences and i suppose the first few paragraphs in your book yeah i mean i used to be a tv editor for quite a long time and so i spent a lot of time editing sequences often documentaries live music and stuff as well so you get a very good sense when you're doing that of how to come in and out of things. That's a lot of what editing sequences is about. Yes. And how you can kind of <clears throat> come into a scene on a door slam or on a movement or on, you know, you don't have to start with, well, it was a big room and the door <laughs> looked like this and the fireplace looked like that. I think there's always a temptation to kind of go, right, here's a big wide shot. Here's a mid shot. Yeah. And now I'll find the person. What's the person doing? What's the person thinking? And that is kind of 
not always there's nothing wrong with that necessarily but it's often not the most involving way in readers are surprisingly good at kind of filling stuff in later Mm. you know so if you don't know what someone's hair's like for seven chapters and then in the eighth chapter someone goes oh they got this long red hair you're like oh have they and then it just becomes part of your your kind of image for that character you don't need to know it all up front no i think especially if you're in someone's point of view my my feeling is always you want to create this sense of what it's like to be that person, of what that person's yes. experiencing. And rarely do people kind of wake up in their own bed and say, oh, look at my bedroom. It's a white room. It has a <laughs> big window. Uh, I push back the curtains. They're floral curtains. I look out at my own garden, which has three pine trees and a large <laughs> lot. That's not what life's like, you know, no. because things that are familiar and normal don't need to be described. So I try to very much avoid lots of description of things that would be familiar and obvious to the characters themselves. I think it works really well because a common piece of writing advice that is often passed down to new authors is like, don't start with your character waking up, right? Like don't start with them waking up (laughs) from a dream. But the reason why that advice is usually given is exactly what you were just saying before is usually they wake up, they go about their boring everyday routine. They describe their reflection in the mirror And there's nothing particularly like special or enticing or hooking about it. But I think what you've done here is really good because it's like every line is kind of raising a question. It's like, Ricker, okay, like who's the person calling this out? We've got an exclamation mark here. There's some urgency. Why are they urgent? She's prizing one eye open. She's seeing this like slit of brightness coming through. Okay, what's happened to her? Has she been knocked unconscious? Like she's been poisoned? Like what's going on here? Come back. Okay, she's you know, maybe had some vision or she's fainted or something like that. Then we're getting this sort of next sentence here and you're going on about how, okay, she's had a dowel in her her mouth. Why did she need to have this dowel inside her? Like, what did she just go through? She's obviously like in a bit of a dire state of things. And then right when, you know, it feels like we kind of need to give the reader some concrete detail, you're giving us this bigger question of like, what did you see, right? And combined with the... um. Combined with the the sort of description of Ison here being this like very strange looking woman or whatever, it kind of then has this bigger question about like, okay, what's going on? And then there's a prophecy and the prophecy leads into like questions for later in the story. So you're kind of like yeah. working from the micro scale of intrigue out to the macro scale of okay, like now I actually have quite a few questions about how this world is operating. Yeah, and there's a certain level of look at my hands, look at my hands, woo woo woo, yeah. going on here as well, which is uh Perhaps slightly cheating in the sense that, as you say, you're just start, starting to ask these questions. They're like, oh, no, look at this. Look at this. Oh, no, we've got this going on. So it, it kind of it, it hits you with a lot of stuff very quickly. It is quite confrontational in that sense. It doesn't let you find your feet. But I think that kind of just demonstrates how, you know, how much a reader can just find their feet. And uh, if they're interested sentence to sentence, then they'll put it together over time. And I suppose it also, the fact that it's quite fragmented and fast and weird gets across the sense of, you know, where she's at, what what's going on for her, how she sings. She's still splintered. She doesn't really know what's going on. And she's quite kind of flighty and uh, scattered at the best of times. That's kind of what she's like. So, I mean, I'm always in the detail of the writing and in the general way that it seems constructed. The first kind of concern is getting a sense of the person whose point of view we're in. And so I suppose, again, that that serves to do that in this case. And as you say, I think, and I I may have missed something earlier, but it feels like the first actual setting description we have only comes at this point here, which is maybe, I don't know, like 500 words into the story. Like it's certainly not on the opening page, but you don't really need Mm -hmm. it early on. You know, like we get the sense that they're outdoors and we're just so distracted or you know focused on the dialogue between them and the prophecy that it doesn't really matter like where they kind of are until a little bit later on in the chapter so yeah that's a good example Mm. of how like you don't need to have the big establishing wide drone shot as you zoom down to the main character's house of them waking up or something like that and for me i mean the setting is rarely that important anyway Mm. i mean it's not unimportant but it's like the it's like the sets at the theater I mean, how often does someone come from the theatre saying the acting was bad, the dialogue was bad, the play stank, but, you know, those sets were great, five stars. <laughs> That's the, a really the good sets point. Are, the sets are part of it. Yes. But they're not that important a part of it in my mind. And I think often with fantasy, people feel like, well, 
the thing that defines fantasy is the secondary world and the mystical mm. magic and the monsters and all those things that normal fiction doesn't have, you know? But actually, I think the most important stuff is still the stuff that's important in any fiction, which is kind of character, plot, relationships between characters, dialogue, and the settings useful and important insofar as it bears on those things. So in a way, you're looking at my priority list here and the fact that the settings are don't, you know, don't even get to the immediate setting for 500 words sort of demonstrates that I'm much, much more interested in hearing what's going on with the people and kind of getting them set up, getting the reader familiar with them before we, you know, start to get into that. But even then, you see that even that paragraph, we're pretty close, not far into it. It's the first cloak our father gave her. So we're, we're back to the people and their relationships. And, mm. you know, we, by that line, we understand very quickly she might have a caring father who's, you know, procured for her this cloak. And it's about her, you know, she's chewing, she's chasing itches with her black edged fingernails. Yeah, I think the introduction with, with Ricca and is quite interesting to me because it almost reminds me of Macbeth in some sense where the opening of Macbeth is very much like... Well, Shakespeare's not quite on my level. I'm not saying no, I'm a, I, upset, I didn't want to... Uh, I'm trying to bring up his profile Paris. a little bit. That's right. I um, mean, Shakespeare <laughs> started and then I refined and improved on the basic building blocks he provided is the way that I like to look at. Yes, correct. Absolutely. Shakespeare crawled so that Jerry Abercrombie could run, as, as they say in the uh, literature. Yeah, I love it. I love yes. it. Or leap, leap into the sky. Absolutely. <laughs> So, you know, I think you could, he could really be someone pretty big someday though. So it, it, it's important that we kind of use our platform to, to raise the profile of these lesser known authors the boy, out there. The boy's done well so far, you know, I, exactly. I, I watch his career with interest. That's right. Um, but yeah. the beginning of Macbeth is, is similar in the sense that you have Macbeth uh, and I think it's Horatio, I, I forget the, his second in command person, but they kind of meet the witches right after they've just done their, their prophecy and they give them a quiet ominous, uh, you know, description of events that could happen in the future that don't really seem to make sense, mm -hmm. that have a lot of um, room for interpretation, shall we say, as to how they are kind of addressed. And I think that the introduction with Ricca is interesting because, as you say, like the prophecy that she provides is something that is very symbolic and yet it is tied with something that is extremely specific of, I saw this particular city burning and then Later in the chapter, we indeed see that city burning. So we at least get the sense that maybe there is something to be said about her abilities here. Yeah. But the prophecy that one doesn't itself... take too long to pay off. No, exactly. It's like, <laughs> give, the reader, give the reader something up front, you know, and then keep something in reserve for later, but make sure you're still yes. giving them something. So I never like things where, you know, you, you hear about, okay, here's a, a really exciting thing that's going to happen. All you need to do is wait seven books. <laughs> and I'm going to give that to you. You kind of want to, you know, there's an exciting thing going to happen. And here's some of it right now. I think also something that I think really elevates this beyond just simply being a scene where there's an ominous prophecy and then we go from there is actually like Ison's character and her reactions to it. You know, so I was yeah. wondering if you could talk a little bit through how you kind of found Ison's voice and how important you think <laughs> her skepticism towards this mystic mystical ability is in this opening yeah i mean uh so isn't is kind of the um straight man is she to to ricka well she's she's kind of comic relief up to a point she's also pretty sinister and pretty clued up and pretty competent ricka's going back to ricka and savine as a contrast savine is ultra competent and very controlled and very confident Ricker is entirely unconfident and incompetent and really quite a babe in the woods at this point. Uh, she's young. She's kind of a bit infantilized because she's prone to these constant fits. And so she's been kind of wrapped in cotton wool by her father and so on. So she needs someone to take care of her. And Ricker's sort of in that, uh, is and is in that kind of role. Um, she's also from this culture of hillmen, hill women, this hill people who are kind of, even within the relative relatively primitive north they're kind of seen as as more primitive a little bit savage um maybe in touch with the natural world and the kind of magical world a little bit more than anyone else and so isn't is kind of their 
in theory, to help guide Ricker in understanding how these visions work. Um, how her kind of tone of voice, I mean, obviously she has this uh, weird uh, mode of expression. Mayhap the turning of time's wheel shall unlock the secrets of these visions. So she's sort of, uh, <laughs> it's, it's hard to explain how this developed, but in part it comes from an earlier book because she has a father who also speaks in this kind of, Yes, weirdly circular, elaborate way that, in to some degree, doesn't actually deliver much. Uh, yeah. But he's also <laughs> quite funny. Um, but there's a sort of a, there's a trickery to it as well because the meaning sort of hidden in all this uh, in all this kind of circular, weird, round and round talk that she does, um, and she's clearly very clever while mm. playing up to be slightly stupid at times. You know, she, yes. she plays on the idea of this of this primitive hill woman who, you know, talks a load of nonsense. But there's a lot of uh there's a lot of truth going on as well. And so she kind of serves the role as the of the of the older mentor to Ricker, I suppose. Um and a lot, as I was saying earlier, a lot of the kind of the mode of expression and the way she talks is a kind of is a trial and error that you you kind of constantly come back to. And I do one pass towards the end, which is sort of specifically a character pass where I go through and I'm looking at the dialogue and the behavior of the characters. So for instance, where it says there isn't held a fingertip to her scarred lips, the way she did when she was on the verge of deep pronouncements, that'll be a, a mannerism she's used somewhere. And then mm -hmm. I thought, okay, so that feels like a mannerism that is meaningful. She takes this moment. Hmm. And that's kind of, indicative of her character in a way when i'm first writing she might have nodded or shrugged or smiled or done something very neutral the purpose of that pass is to kind of turn those generic and obvious things into something that is more illustrative of the personality and feels a bit more uh you know a bit more distinct yes. and gives the sense of her being that so that there's always a sense of her personality coming through when she, whenever she says or does anything is the is the hope I think that's one of the most empowering things I've actually learned from you from listening to many of your interviews and, and the interview we did a few years ago in my own writing is just that sense of you can come back and change a lot of these generic descriptions, yeah. whether it's a nod or a shrug or a sigh, and you can actually turn it into something that tells you a lot more about the character. So looking at that sentence in particular, we're getting a lot of things there. Like we're getting the fact that, okay, she's got scarred lips. Like this is someone who's probably lived a pretty rugged, maybe somewhat difficult life in some ways. Um, yeah. You know, she's pausing on the verge of deep pronouncements. As you say, it's someone who kind of like has that gravitas about her almost and has the ability to mm. speak in a way that like makes people like really pay a lot of heed to what she's saying. And then again, like you're contrasting that in a really cool way when she goes, I have no freaking yeah. clue. So you're getting like the three cool things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's it. That's the deep pronouncement. <laughs> then she tries to kind of, she tries to zhuzh it up by saying, mayhap the turning of time's wheel shall unlock the secrets. And yes. Rick is like, wait and see, you're saying. You know? So she, she's, there's, a, there's a lot of kind of bathos, I suppose, there in the sense of, you're going to get a deep pronouncement? I've no freaking yes. clue. And then she tries to dress it up and then Rick is like, oh, so we'll wait and see. So there's a constant kind of sense of slightly taking the piss. And I suppose... Yeah you know, undermining the pomposity that you can sometimes get with high fantasy has sort of always been a little bit my stock in trade. So there's a fair bit of that going on here as well. One of the things I love the most about your writing is how distinctive the voice is for each character. And probably a large part of that comes from your willingness to take them in directions that we maybe don't typically see in a lot of these stories, yeah. as you've mentioned before. How important do you feel like that overall arc is to a character's voice or is it a bit of a chicken and an egg situation where those things tend to just influence each other and it's hard to see where it kind of started from i think it is very chicken and egg especially if you're you know writing something as one big story then going over and revising it and tweaking it in order to fit the shape you've found as you went through um so it's very hard once you've got to the end and you're looking at something that's kind of completed and refined like this to kind of say where did that idea come from when did that happen you know I'm not sure what the first draft of this would have looked like. Probably very different. Yes. Maybe not very different in some areas. So, but it's hard to remember what came first. Um, so I don't know on, is the answer to that, I guess. Um, 
it's kind of constant. You're constantly developing and rethinking and calibrating characters, you know? So you might have someone, I remember when I was writing the heroes, Calder started off much more neutral Mm. towards the end. He makes a kind of surprising decision to not be ruthless, but do the kind of sympathetic positive, make this positive choice to, to not kill someone and to kind of give up power in a way. Yes. And so to make that work, I had to make him more ambitious and more unpleasant. And so the appearance mm. all the way through is that this is a guy entirely driven by ambition, who is a slime, who's a plotter, who, you know, is constantly moving the pieces into a position where he can, you know, seize what he wants. And then when he finally is offered what he wants, apparently, he chooses not to do it. And that becomes more surprising, more interesting if he's more slimy and ambitious early on. So that became the kind of defining thing of his character, making him more slimy and ambitious so that that payoff is kind of more surprising and affecting when it does come. So, yeah, you're constantly calibrating these things to kind of make them work a little bit better, I guess. I think that's a very useful thing for writers to know as well, that sense that you don't have to do it all at once. And sometimes Mm. like whenever I'm editing books for different writers or helping coach them, like I see this pressure that they have. So it's almost constricting where it's like, I can't start writing my first chapter because I need like everything to be right from the get go for this. But in reality, as you say, first of all, you're probably going to forget what your first draft even looked like. And second of all, you're going to have the ability to come back to it later and to tweak it and change things around. Um, So I think that's a very useful lesson to know for sure. And you can't tweak what's not there. Exactly. You better to better to crack on. I mean, I, I always have this temptation to plan. I've got to get a good plan, get my plan mm. in place. But actually, I've found over time that until I start writing from a given character's point of view, it's very hard to really get a sense of what they're like. And so usually these days, I try to write the first few chapters very early in the process when I first start mm. thinking about it. I try and just get okay, let's find these people in the circumstances that are natural for them and that are arresting for them and we'll get a sense of who they are and then just experiment a little bit with what the writing feels like because you can actually just introduce the plot later if you want to. You can kind of get some more plot into those early themes later on once you know what the plot's going to be. Um, But understanding who the people are and who the characters are can help you to do the, the planning. And also... It's kind of boring doing the plan, you know? It's kind of just the bones without the juicy meat mm. on the bones. And without so, a sense of voice or exploration. Exactly. It can be inspiring to get going and see what's, what's coming out and feel like, ah, this is, this is funny. This is exciting. This is fun. Yes. This is good. And then you feel a bit more inspired to kind of plan out what might happen. So, do you plan for the second and, and third books in a trilogy, for example? Like once you start getting the sense of, um, like Rika's voice, for example, do you then kind of go and plan like where her arc is going in the rest of the series? Like what's the process look like for you? So with these books, as I say, they were like one integrated big arc trilogy with a, you know, quite a complicated coming and going a plot. And I think the the format basically with those was I started off with, okay, let's split this into nine parts, three books of three parts each, and then think about each of those parts in terms of What's the basic focus of this part? Um, what might be the kind of defining big action sequence or you know the big jeopardy, the big moment, so that each part's got at least one of those big moments in it. Um, and then I was thinking about who are the characters and you know thinking about covering the action and the kind of different stratas of society and the different cultures in a way that would give me as big a, a kind of view of events as I possibly could. So I'm starting with characters. I'm starting with a rough idea of, of what the action of the story is. And once I feel kind of happy with where the whole thing is going and where people are going to end up and what the very rough arcs are going to be. So, you know, in book one, there'll be a kind of failed revolution early on. Uh, but largely it's kind of maneuvering the pieces into place. Then book two is going to be a kind of civil war and book three is going to be a big social revolution. That's kind of the very basic stuff. And then splitting it down into 
different, you know, three parts in each of those cases, defining a bit more, you know, what the action of each part will be. And that, that then, you know, naturally starts to give you some ideas of what characters might be caught up in what events at what time, where they might interact or come into conflict with each other. Um, and then I start planning each part in much more detail. And so in the case of, of these books, I'd kind of plan the first part and I'd think about exactly what the action would be in the different kind of areas of the book and who was best placed to kind of cover that action and how I was going to kind of interleave the various points of view. And I get a kind of couple of paragraphs for each chapter of roughly what the action is going to be, who's involved, what's going on. And then I start kind of writing it and, you know, that's when you, if, if it's the first part, the start, very start of a trilogy, very quickly ideas start to develop then about right who, who these people are, what's going to work. And, and naturally the rest of the story becomes fleshed out so that when you get to plan the second part, you've got a much better idea than what you're dealing with, who the people are, where they're going. And so you kind of, you know, the planning, the rough planning happens early, but the detailed planning fleshes out as you go and kind of can react and shift according to what the characters do and how they feel and what feels natural for them. Um, so the planning and the writing goes hand in hand these days much more. And I find that it's good to have a plan, but you, you also don't want to be kind of too in hoc to your plan. You've got yes, to be absolutely. flexible. Yeah. Yeah, I personally love planning, but you're right. You need to find that balance between it giving you the freedom and the scaffold to know you're in going in the right direction, but also not feeling like a straitjacket that's preventing you from taking characters down the interesting pathways that crop up as you're going through the process. So it's cool to kind of hear yeah. how you go between the exploration and the the more, I suppose the exploration is the more creative side of the brain. And then the the planning aspect is the more kind of like, okay, does this structure sort of merge up here nicely? Yeah. And I mean, oftentimes I'll kind of leave the the planning of the complicated action type sequences till later when I mm. want to kind of get there because they're sometimes quite detailed and need a lot more thinking about, you know, what points of view you'll use, what the action will be, how it's, how the different characters will kind of knit together and interrelate. Um, so you can kind of, you know, if you reach a sequence and you think, I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to do here. That's fine. You can work it out later. And often things change a lot in the writing as well. As I say, you're constantly yes. refining and revising. So you need to have that ability to move things around after the fact. Now, in a moment, we're going to go into analyzing chapter four from the novel, which is where we meet Savine, my personal favorite character from this series. But first, I had so much fun analyzing this opening chapter with Joe that I decided I'm going to run a live first chapter critique workshop for you guys. After editing fantasy novels for over 30 writers and after publishing four fantasy novels of my own, I've had a lot of experience of writing and improving first chapters both in my novels and in other writers' novels. In this live workshop, you'll be able to submit your first chapter in to me and I'll be picking three people's chapters to analyze and critique and improve live in the call. As we go through this, you'll learn the principles behind how to develop a unique sense of character voice, how to describe your characters in a compelling way, and how to hook readers with your plot details right from the first page so that they have no choice but to buy your book and binge through the entire thing. So if you're a fantasy writer and you're looking to improve your first chapter and you could do with some feedback and help from me, then go to jedhern.com forward slash character dash workshop to sign up. The link and the date for this workshop is in the description below this video. This is a paid workshop and spots are limited, so get your tickets quickly if you're interested. And now let's continue on with our analysis of A Little Hatred as we move here into chapter four. Okay, so this is chapter four from A Little Hatred, Keeping Score. It's the introduction to Savine Dan Glotka, who I think is probably my personal favorite character from the Age of Madness. So oh, nice. I'm very interested to kind of get into this. Can you just give us like a bit of yeah. an overview and summary of what this chapter is about to begin with? So this is an introduction to Savine, who is uh, the kind of uh, the new woman who defines the new world that is developing because she's firstly a woman in a in what has been a very male dominated world, and she has found a way to be powerful and to influence the world through money fundamentally and through being an investor. So she's an investor. She buys ideas. She buys people. She networks, she connects one person with another. And so she kind of has this network of influence and investment and money 
which has made her very influential and powerful. She also has a very powerful father, as it yes. happens, who's quite well known and who comes up in this chapter, naturally. And so this is kind of getting a sense early on of how she operates and therefore how the kind of new world operates and her place within it. So I think what's interesting about this chapter here is compared to Ricker's chapter where you start with dialogue and it's quite short, there's a lot of white space on the page. We don't really get a lot of dialogue to begin with here and there's a lot more denseness in the language and a lot more focus on the setting here. So can you just talk me through yeah. a little bit about the contrast and your decision-making process around that? Yeah, I mean, so decision-making process is possibly giving it a little too much uh, dignity. <laughs> uh, I mean, a lot, a lot of this is quite instinctive um, yes. at, when you do it. And so not entirely, but some of it certainly. And so in a way, when you come back to talk about it like this, <laughs> it's kind of interesting to think to yourself, oh, yeah, that, that's true. Why did I do that? And then you start to think about it after the fact in a way. But certainly, you know, this is much more or a bit more traditional in a sense. We're starting with a bit of scene setting, but it's quite quick and intimate. We don't know where we are really. Mm. There's just clearly some, you know, we, we know that we're from we're in Savine's point of view. We know she's enjoying herself because she was always enjoying herself, at least yes. early on in these books. Uh, certainly <laughs> not later, but uh, maybe not later on, yes. <laughs> um, and um, you get a sense very quickly of industry and the new kind of world of industry and sparks and machinery and men being in a way pressed into becoming machines themselves, straining bodies Absolutely. and straining machinery together. And it's all in the service of her and making yes. her rich. And straight away we see that this is about what she owns and she's delighted because she owns all this stuff and it makes lots of money. Yes. So we kind of get that quite quickly. So I suppose that's the purpose of these first few. And it's also, it's got this drop paragraph, which I do a lot. I do too much, mm. honestly. And actually she probably, Savine probably shouldn't be doing that. I try to, well, it works. It kind of, I often do this thing of a uh, long paragraph punchline, long paragraph punchline. It's kind yes. of a, a bit of a habit with me. And sometimes I have to cut it out a bit over time or focus it more on one character. So Ferro in the first law does this all the time. It, virtually yeah. all of her prose is done this way. It's kind of long paragraph, punchline, long paragraph, punchline. I find it very effective as a rhythm. And you can see how here it kind of, you have the setup and, and some description, and then it emphasizes this point, which is the key point for her that she owns part of this. That's why she's interested. Otherwise, she's not interested. And so yes. we kind of very quickly get located in her and what her concerns are. And then, of course, the second paragraph, or the second big paragraph, the third one, is basically, it's a lot, there's not a lot there to actually learn or hear about. Mm. But the key point is, she's much more interested in exactly what she owns exactly the numbers, you know, who owns what, what are the items, what are they worth, what's my part of it? And that, in a way, there's as much thought there about exactly the precise stuff that she owns as there is about, you know, the, the visuals or what's going on. So it kind of qu quickly, I suppose, sets up the thought process, her thought process of, you know, what do I own? Where's the money? In some ways, it's like you're describing this really interesting painting here. And then this is like the caption of the artist who painted it in some ways. So it's like this nice <laughs> yeah. one, two punch nice. of, okay, cool. Here's some interesting world building. But again, like there are some key details in here that tell you a lot about how Savine she sees the world. Like the fact that the people who are working the machines that are working, basically the same thing to her. Like they're both meaningless. They have no personality. They're just essentially like beholden to her. And yeah. the almost... Well, I would say almost, but that's probably not even the case. The demonic way in which it's described here, you know, the straining mm. machinery and the straining bodies rendered devilish by the glow of molten metal. It's like she's walking through hell in a sense and she's smiling at the same time. It's a really interesting because juxtaposition. Because she's the devil, right? She's in charge. Yeah, she's her, she's, her she's the person she's going around to um, make sure everyone's funny being it punished enough. <laughs> A lot of the contemporary writing about the Industrial Revolution had this kind of uh, imagery of hell. 
it was mm. a really common thing there, you know. Uh, and so I kind of, I suppose, picking picking that up a little bit. Um, and then also the music of money being made, I now notice, apart, of course, from the superb assonance of the music of money being made, the end yes. sounds like Details, details. But um, there's also the fact that this is a horrible discordant din, really. But to her, it's music because yeah. there's money being made. You know, it couldn't sound sweeter because she is enriched. Exactly. I think that's one of my favorite things to, to try to achieve with world building and descriptions is how can my character describe this in a way that 95% of other characters would not describe it? You know, like yeah. you throw most characters into this setting, like you throw Logan, for example, from the first lore into this setting, and he's probably just like overwhelmed by all the noise and on edge by it. And I don't know, maybe he's thinking about the clinking hammers and it's reminding him of some battles he's fought in or something like that. And yeah, that yeah. tells you a lot about his character. Absolutely. But to Savine, it's like, it's music. Like how many other characters would describe this hellish setting as a musical setting? Like it's just such a yeah. brilliant detail for kind of like telling you immediately that she's built quite different to a lot of the other people that you may have read about in similar stories. Yeah. No, I think, I think you're right. And I mean, I think it's true that, you know, as a fantasy character, I've written a lot of characters who are very classic Logan Ninefingers. He's a barbarian who like kills people with a sword and stuff. It's not the first yeah. time we've seen that trope basically. Though my one is obviously very different, obviously. Of course, of course. But, but Savine is quite, a, and you know, Ricker for that matter, you, you know, we, mm. we are probably used to young girls with mysterious magical talent, you know, who can perhaps see glimpses of the future and stuff like that. That's not exactly the first time. But I think Savine as, a, as an investor, a female investor in a kind of male world is quite an unusual type of character for this type of story. So yes. again, this perhaps feels a little different to what one might expect from a fantasy book. I think that's why I found her my favorite character from the series. And she has a really interesting arc that she goes through as well. But I think that she has such a, a great degree of complexity to her. Like I, I did a, a little exercise a while ago where I kind of mapped out all of the contradictions that Savine has in her story. Right. And I kind of found sort of eight key ones. They were things like, you know, she appears really polished and and prim and pretty and proper, but she also like you know, shaves her head bold and like does dueling practice to make sure that she's able to defend herself. And there's like that kind of nice juxtaposition there between someone who, you know, looks really like, uh, I suppose, like pretty and, and privileged or whatever, but is also like willing to kind of like be a bit of a savage and get down and dirty at the same time. And there's so many other interesting contradictions in her character as well, which just leave you constantly in this state of I suppose, suspense about how she's going to behave or react in any given situation. Um, and we mm. see a lot of those contradictions get built in the opening here as well. How much do you directly think about contradictions when it comes to characters? I don't know. It's not something I would necessarily, that would be at the forefront of my mind, or at least I wouldn't think to myself, let's have someone who can be very, who seems warm and loving, but can be very cold and, and calculating internally. Or actually, I might think that. Because funnily enough, I'm, I'm working on a character right now who comes across as, and is very keen to present herself as, someone who is cold, hard, driven by a much greater purpose to which everything must be sacrificed. Yes. And she has a horrible failure in her past, or you know, a, an awful thing has happened which has led to her being ostracised fundamentally. And you assume the awful thing is she she went too far and did something inc so incredibly ruthless that it became unforgivable. But actually, the the problem is that she was merciful at the wrong time, you know? Interesting. And she... Yeah. So all of her internal monologue is how you've got to be ruthless. You've got to, you know, you've got to always have the Take highest cause yours, in that mind. Sort of thing. Mm. Um. And so I suppose it is on my mind sometimes, you know, how are you going to get a surprise out of this character? What's the big twist going to be? I mean, I'm, I'm often looking for kind of twists on a, on a character level, but there might be several to a story. And I mean, Savine, as we were saying earlier, is not someone who, who gets better and, you know, steadily becomes saintly over time, having started as this <laughs> no. inquisitive, ruthless person. Yes. You know, she, without wanting to spoil anything, she has a kind of, you know, horrific experience halfway through when there's this smaller revolution and she has to kind of, she's almost captured by 
revolutionaries for whom she is not a popular figure, let's say, no. <laughs> and uh, and is then forced to kind of survive amongst the filth. Um, and that experience does not make her think, well, life is really terrible for a lot of the kind of people that I employ in my factories and I should be much nicer to them. She doubles down basically and is like, I will never be in that position yeah. again, whatever <laughs> is necessary. So she becomes kind of both more brittle and more ruthless kind of simultaneously. And I like that sort of stuff, but that that's only kind of a third of the way to her arc. She then kind of comes and goes in, in other ways thereafter. So I like people who can continue to surprise you and develop in different directions. And I love people who fail to change, mm. you know, because to me that is very true of life. You know, people can change, but it's very hard to do. And very often they return, like, you know, alcoholics beat the bottle for a year, for two years, for 10 years, mm. and then they fall off the wagon, you know, and then they beat the bottle again. It's not a process of, I was an alcoholic and now I am. Exactly. It's exactly. a, it's an endless fight, you know, and it's not a simple move in one direction. And it's also about habit. And I very much believe people are, are kind of people have had creatures of habit. And um, as long as they continue in their old ways and their old habits, it's very hard to change. But when you're suddenly dropped into a new setting, you can be a new person and, and kind of reinvent yourself. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm always fascinated by the failure to change just as I am, you know, the failure to win or the, the people who snatch defeat from the jaws of victory, you know, yes. <laughs> and there's a lot of moments that like that throughout this series as well, which I, I oh, quite enjoy. Yeah. Um, no one doubt. thing I, I really noticed rereading through this chapter earlier today was the role of Zuri in this opening scene. And yeah. you know, Zuri like has some interesting secrets like later on in the series in this opening scene, she's very much like an attendant of Savine's. She's kind of there to do almost like a bit of, you know, banter with Savine at many times. Like if yeah. I kind of scroll down, she constantly has this sort of um, thing where she'll quote, you know, things from her scripture teacher and uh -huh, sometimes yeah. they kind of, you know, reflect in a really interesting way. I'll see if I can get to a specific example. Yeah, this is a good example, right? So like later on, we've got Savine kind of like blackmailing <laughs> yeah. this architect to to give her um, a better cut of his business. So, you know, he wants yeah. to give her like one twentieth of this particular project. She demands one fifth. He's kind of like, get out of here. That's crazy. I only have one fifth myself. And then Savine kind of brings up um, the fact that she's visiting this notorious gossip later on tonight yep. who, you know, will spread some nasty, nasty words about um, the architect here. And we've got Zuri kind of being like, <laughs> you know, it pains me to speak ill of one of God's creatures, but she is an abysmal blabbermouth. And like, that's just, a, <laughs> yeah. it's something where it's like, there's an interest, there's a lot of interesting contradictions built into Zuri where it's like, you know, on one hand, she's kind of saying things that are like sort of pious and sort of like, very upright, but you also get a sense that she's like almost saying them in a really sarcastic way. And um, I wonder, like, yeah. do you think that this chapter, if it was just Savine going around and blackmailing people and Zuri wasn't there, like, how do you feel like that would change the tone of things? And do you feel like it would not work in quite the same way? Yeah. I mean, without looking to, you know, every example, I, I suppose she's almost, she's almost another part of Savine. She's almost mm. another voice in Savine's head sometimes. And they they work in total machine-like, smooth kind of uh they work together, complementary, you know. Yes. And 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 this is a good example of how Zuri always knows exactly what to say to kind of give the right shading, the right uh intensity, the right kind of added spice to what Savine's saying. So she's almost like she's the hype man. Yeah. The rapper, <laughs> you know? It's so so Savine's the rapper who's kind of leading what's going on, but Zuri's always there to kind of add the add the little bit of emphasis. But she also humanizes Savine a little bit because yes. you know Savine can come across as incredibly cold and calculating and unpleasant. And so it's kind of nice to see that she also has someone who uh is a genuine kind of someone who she genuinely respects and kind of loves really and needs quite desperately. I'm not sure if there's anything in this chapter particularly, but there's certainly 
at other times this this indication that she sort of desperately really needs Zuri alongside her and uh so there's a, there's a kind of it's a, it's a key friendship and a humanizing influence as well as this kind of calculated act they have this double act i think it's one of the reasons why this introduction for savine feels more fun than it feels cruel if that makes sense like i think if savine yeah. is just going through it and she's just extorting and blackmailing these people just by herself it's very easy as a reader to like maybe not connect with her in the same way but because it's like savine and like her best friend zuri like going off and just shaking down these characters and getting a bunch of money out of them yeah it kind of feels like a fun buddy cop dynamic almost and I know you're a big fan yeah. of um, James Elroy's novels. I'm, I was re-watching LA Confidential the other night as well. There's a yeah. lot of great scenes where they do that, where it's like, you know, the cop is doing something that's like objectively kind of bad, but because they're doing it with like their buddies, there's almost an element where you are able to like kind of see yourself go into the story a little bit more. Like if it was just Savine by herself, maybe it's hard for you to connect with her. But the fact that Zuri's there, it's almost like giving you more permission to like, come in and be beside Savine as she's going away and, and doing all this blackmail. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's interesting as well that you've got Rika and Izan as a double act, you know, and Savine yeah. and Zuri as a double act. And they're very different style, but they both allow you to kind of uh, verbalise some of the stuff that otherwise might be quite clunky internal monologue, you know. And so it's always useful to have a set of characters around a character who you know, allow them to vocalize. Dialogue's just always the most efficient and kind of subtle and effective tool, I think, to get stuff done. Um, so if they've got someone, a companion, they can they can talk to you. That's where you really, I find, start cooking with gas. I think that's one of the, the great strengths about, um, particularly there's a scene later on in this story where you kind of take all of your main important characters and you just like throw them into this ball and you cut between the point of views between all of them. And because you've built them up to that point, it's such a scene that crackles with intensity and like emotional weight because you're kind of like supporting everyone. Like you can kind of sympathize with everyone, but they're working at cross purposes. And again, it's like, I feel like that's such a good setup for a lot of scenes is like just focus on throwing characters into a room with each other and forcing them to kind of like, you know, argue with each other um, for lack of a better term. But um. One other thing that I think is really interesting to look at here is this is the way that you actually kind of introduce Savine's name. So, you know, she goes into yeah. this kind of CD bar and the bartender kind of is like, you know, flirting with her a bit because she looks way too proper to be in such a lowly establishment. And Savine, mm -hmm. like, uh, well, talk me through it. She kind of like toys with him in an interesting way and then reveals her name later on. Like, what was your, you know, your process for this? I suppose my process for this was that <clears throat> because Savine is the daughter of, you know, a very central character from the first uh, the first trilogy and probably my best known or one of my best known characters, really, it's kind of when the name's revealed, it's going to be a significant moment for readers. And so you don't want to throw that away, you know, yes. because the fact she's this guy's daughter is going to land quite heavy with them and be quite significant with them. And is straight away going to tell, you know, the readers something about where she is in society and what her kind of worldview is, because he's a notoriously ruthless torturer and kind of spy, really, a, a eminence grise, a kind of Cardinal Richelieu figure now at this point. Yes. And so we don't know that she's his daughter. We come to her not knowing who she is, and obviously it's introduced here as she... Toys with this unfortunate barman, basically, he's trying to <laughs> shatter her up. And so she tries, she kind of does the the slightly deductive thing, which includes the slide. If you I love enjoy this the line. tip, you'll go mad for the so whole good. thing. <laughs> yeah, which is perhaps a little much, but you know, there you go. Um, and then she she delivers the punchline of Glockter, and then, you know, he obviously is uh he shits his pants. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's a very fearsome name. Indeed. And then it's uh, something that um yeah. I was just gonna say it's something that works well even if you haven't read the previous books in this series, though. And I think like mm. that's that's a real benefit of introduction sometimes, right? Is like just through the ways that different characters respond to the main character revealing key things about them or even their own presence. 
Um, like there's a good example in, in Goodfellas uh, where all these mafioso types are just like messing around outside this, uh, this restaurant. And then the leader of the gang comes out and everyone like instantly goes serious. And there's a great line where they say, you know, Paulie wasn't someone you'd think would move fast, but that's because he never had to move for nobody. And it's just like instantly establishing yeah. the threat of this guy and where he's coming from. So I think it works well, like even if you don't have the sh- context from before, but if like me, you mm. do have the context of reading all these <clears throat> things about Glocka, it like hits you in such a big way. And I remember the first time I read this, I was like, oh my God, like that's, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, and you're right. And there's, there's often a balancing act to be done as you get through a series of, you know, how much you think about people who've read the whole lot, how much you think about people who might be new readers and try to play those things off against each other. And usually for me, it comes down to just sticking with the character you're with and making them as much as you can the centre of the story and let other people kind of come in and out of their orbit. And then hopefully it will make some kind of sense anyway. What would you say are the main kind of mistakes and the main bits of advice you have for writers when they're coming to introduce their characters in in their own stories? And of course, you know, this is the kind of thing where there's no one right way to do it by any means, but what would you say are maybe the main mistakes you might've made like earlier on in your writing career or things that you've had to learn? And then what are kind of the key lessons or, or takeaways you would kind of give to writers? Well, I suppose from the point of view of introducing characters, it's introduce the character, not the world or the plot, I suppose would be my advice. Every, every book's different. Every writer's different in the things they focus on, the approach they take. That's what's worked for me. And when you're writing kind of point of view writing, which te- you know, is, is commonly how people do write these days, I think it's important to, you know, not focus on those details and those things that aren't important to them, you know? So put yourself in the shoes of the character. Don't put yourself in the shoes of the reader. Don't think, oh, I've got to explain the world. I've got to explain the setting. I've got to set up the room. I've got to kind of lay the table. Don't worry too much about the table. Get into the meal as quickly Mm. as you can. And then you can let the reader kind of catch up over time. I think readers generally thank you for that. You know, being yes, giving them puzzles to solve, giving them things to think about. So I suppose that's the the best piece of advice I'd have to my younger self. Thank you so much for coming on, Joe. That was fantastic. It's a pleasure. Great to talk to you. Thanks. I don't get to talk about the sort of detailed writing stuff that often, so uh, it's nice.